All circumlocutions aside, the embedding is still just a mathematical trick or tool and not a reflection of a physically needed degree of freedom. With that, let's see what the form looks like when we embed a three surface into a four ball. Let's start with a space that has four spatial dimensions. We have our familiar X, Y, and Z, and now we'll toss in a mystical W. The Cartesian spatial length element is given at the top. A small change in distance, dl, is the sum of the squares of the little changes in each coordinate distance. Next, we'll add the needed restriction, that we're looking at a three surface. Normally, we'd call that a sphere, but a solid sphere in four dimensions requires four coordinates. Thus, we're looking at what we would call a hypersurface. This restriction works out to be the sum of x, y, and z squared equal to our radial coordinate, little r. That's just the definition of our hyperradius. Our restriction comes into full force with the second part, w squared plus r squared equals big R squared. Now we've bounded the hypersurface with the big R. Big R here is the radius of the four ball that is wrapped by our three-dimensional hypersurface. I've taken the liberty of converting x, y, and z into polar coordinates for the next line, and this should look quite familiar. It's the same thing we just looked at in the previous slide for s sub k of r for k equals zero. Basically, this statement means that we're embedding a curved three space in a flat four space. However, our embedding dimension is just a tool and not real. If we take the differential of our restriction condition and square it, we get dw squared equals dr squared times r over w squared. This leaves us with dw be converted into little r scaled by the restriction constant big R. Plugging this dr back into the 4D spatial metric and sampling with a tiny bit of algebra gives us a new form of the metric. We can then define k to be the inverse of big R squared. Here, k is the curvature constant and can range from plus big values to zero to minus big values. Previously, in the hyperspherical coordinates, it was either plus one or zero or minus one. This k is different. The final form of this metric for positive values of k is given on the right, where we've once again used the isotropy of space to emphasize the simple angular dependence. Not all 3D spaces can be embedded by placing them in just one more extra dimension. A three spatial dimension negatively curved space with k less than zero requires two extra spatial dimensions for the embedding. I could follow the argument through here, but suffice it to say that the mathematics are tricky and the bang wouldn't be worth the buck for this video. As you can see, this simple restriction would lead us down into the complex plane, requiring a bunch of proofs about complex analysis and much more. The end result is quite similar, though, to the previous slide, except now that the values of k would be negative real numbers, and for your edification, I've chosen to show the spatial metric for k equals minus 1. The saddle diagram here is a real failure for visualization. The cartoon only shows a poorly approximated 2D surface that is represented at exactly one point near the center of the saddle. Every other point in the space would also be represented with such a saddle shape around it, and such diagrams would get messy really fast. And that's just 2D surfaces. Now we're talking about a three-dimensional saddle, that would require being able to see it unfolding into that extra dimension on paper or screen, which is only 2D. The fifth spatial dimension is now required in order to accommodate the unfolding of the 3D hypersurface into an unfolding 4D negative space. It is this second step into a flat five-dimensional manifold that finally gets us to our rotational symmetry. This is some ugly arcana. Perhaps one day I'll do a full video detailing this proof, but since it's not relevant to our current level of discussing cosmology, that is, we don't live in a space with five spatial dimensions, much less four, I'll just stick with stating quite unsatisfactorily that it's serious maths that get us to this very simple metric we see at the bottom. The important thing here, though, is that we have a completely different form for the metric. The bottom metric is indicative of a globally uniform, isotropic, and homogeneous constant negative curvature three-dimensional space in some new coordinate system. Let's finally give a name to this new coordinate system. It's called the Reduced Circumference Polar Coordinate System. In this coordinate system, the little r is completely different. 
Importantly, the form of the metric in this coordinate system looks very different too. Here we have the curvature not being one of the three values, but rather some global constant with a real number value. The theta and the phi are the same as before. So what is this new R? Here is our metric expressed in two different coordinate systems. The top one is the hyperspherical coordinates, and the bottom one is the reduced circumference polar coordinates. The omega is the same in both cases. This is because of the inherent isotropy of these constant curvature spaces. In the hyperspherical coordinate system, little r is what you would normally think of as a radial coordinate. It's the distance from the origin to the point in question. In the reduced circumference polar coordinates, the little r is the length corresponding to the circumference of a circle centered on the origin divided by 2 pi. These two definitions of little r are not the same. They can't be used interchangeably. But the dl squared that they give rise to is exactly the same. There are very likely a whole lot of you are thinking one of the two questions at this point. One, but isn't the circumference of a circle always 2 pi times the radius, so aren't these the same? And two, why bother with making these two metrics at all? If you're going to get the same answer, why mess with these different ones? Can't you just tell me which metric is the right one? The first question is easy. We saw that in curved spaces, circles are either bigger or smaller than their flat space counterparts. The second question I can best answer by asking, what problem are you trying to solve? The first form will be helpful when we want to understand the angular sizes of distant galaxies, as well as keeping the form simple for the concept of distances. The second form is much more suited for calculating orbits. Each coordinate system has its benefits and drawbacks. In the textbook, Ryden uses the hyperspherical coordinates because we are frequently concerned with how the universe looks in all directions around us. We'll want to use this metric to show us how light rays traverse the cosmos from there to here. We show our cosmic bias because we're always at the center of all our observations. If somehow we could bop around the cosmos and construct a truly epically gargantuan circle or triangle out of lasers or cotton string, then yes, we would directly measure the curvature of the universe with the second metric. Irrelevant to its practicality, this would be an excellent way to measure the universe's curvature. But alas, we are tiny critters who will never make it to the next star in the next hundred years, much less into intergalactic space.